interesting summer read and book discussion hosted by the Opportunity Network here at Google in New York City. Feel free to check out the Opportunity Network on Google+, Plus, where you'll find a link to the event that's ongoing now, and post any questions you may have for the author, No Violet, who is here with us. Um, without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to Megan, who's going to give a brief um, introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Megan Nestor. I'm Senior Program Manager at the Opportunity Network. We're a six-year career development and college prep program, and we have some awesome volunteers and students here with us um, who are super excited for this uh, book club. Uh, this is something brand new we've never done before. I hope to make it a tradition. Um, and I just want to say a huge, tremendous thank you to No Violet for joining us. We're so, so excited. We all love the book. Um, and are really excited to ask you some questions. And also another tremendous thank you to Michelle and Catherine, who organized this whole event and made it possible today. So, um, Catherine, can I send it over to you? Sure. And All right. So welcome to the 2013 Summer Read with the Opportunity Network. We invite you to use hashtags as you talk on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and if you feel like using Instagram too, but we have Opnet Summer Read. Um, HOA means hang out on air, as in Google, hang out on air, or the title of the name, uh, the book, We Need New Names. So I just want to open the discussion with a brief talk. Next slide. Um, about this wonderful book that sits in a place called Zimbabwe on the continent of Africa. You know, I always like to remind people that Africa is a continent, it's not a country. But the novel itself is situated in the birthplace of the author in Zimbabwe. And Zimbabwe is a country in southern Africa with a population of about 12 million people. I was fortunate to be able to travel next, um, to uh, Southern Africa, throughout Southern, Southern Africa in my work, um, many years ago. And uh, I fell in love with the Shona Parks there, and the novel just opened up really good memories for me and my own storytelling. So um, I'm still thinking about the wonderful people I met, as well as the beautiful sculptures that I saw, and I encourage every young mind here to always have what, a library card, a passport, and when you're old enough, you can get a driver's license. I think those are like the three cards, you know, everybody should have, right, if you're going places. And there are often the images that we think of when we think of Africa. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? I was pleasantly surprised on my first trip to South Africa that this was the view that I held. This is a picture of Johannesburg. So I'm just giving a little backdrop about my experiences. And, um, you know, so you don't think of the city when you think of Africa, but Africa does have its cities. And um, this is another place I visited next slide, um, in Southern Africa, a country called Swaziland. And these are all countries that are neighboring Zimbabwe. And this is probably uh, next slide. Uh, a, more, a more popular picture of Table Mountain in Cape Town, again in South Africa. So we haven't gotten to um, next slide. And so one of the things about reading a book is it does all kinds of things as you're traveling. So when I was looking through Instagram, I probably wouldn't have paid attention, but Oprah posted her pictures from her time in the Serengeti just like yesterday. So these are probably images that you think of. And when you think of Serengeti, you should think of um, places like Tanzania and Kenya. So these are all different countries in the continent of Africa. And I just wanted to give um, some backdrop. So I thought that that was interesting. And then as I'm dreaming of going to Southern Africa again, I want to go to Kong Bay. If anybody can help me get there, that'd be great. <laughs> Tell me about it. Um, I was actually at another book talk, and someone actually had a connection to Cock Bay. So I'm looking forward to dreaming of, uh, to going sometime in the future. And um, as I was pulling this together, I was also thinking about my first experience with a wonderful Zimbabwean author by the name of Nosipo Maari. 
Um, and she is a neurosurgeon, but she's also a gifted writer. And she wrote this book called Zimzile, a, a letter to my daughter. So if you want to uh, read some more Zimbabwean writers, I encourage you to try to find a copy of her book. She's a practicing neurosurgeon, and she's actually, uh, I think, on the ground in Zimbabwe now. Mm -hmm. So what brings us, how did we get here? How did we get to um, the summer read? Anybody who knows me well knows that whoever I'm with in a group in the summer, I'm going to try to get them to read a book together. Um, ask the people at Robert Johnson Foundation, ask any of my good girlfriends. I think it's important to read in the summer and to read together. What happens when we read together? I think it's almost similar, but it's even better than when we watch a movie together. You have the opportunity to kind of see things together, hear different takes on the book, and what could be better than actually having the author with us as we try to have a discussion together. So we went through a book, uh, a book list, Michelle and Megan and I, and then we heard from you, the crowd, about what books you'd be interested in. And then between time and place and space, we were able to um, come up with this title and come up with this book selection. And at the time, I was thinking, oh, no, Violet might be in Brooklyn, and she might actually be able to come. Um, but one way or another, we were able to connect with her, and we're thankful to Hatchet Books for supplying us with books, and, uh, as well as um, connecting us with New Violet. So that's how we pretty much came together. And we don't want our folks, next slide, our uh, our group that's out there, we set this up intentionally to be the more traditional in-person gathering. And those who are on um, the Hangout with us, please feel free to type in questions I'm following along. And um, we'll try to take your questions. Or if you want to tweet, I might even, I think I can see your tweets too. So you can either way or Facebook, I don't know, you know, we'll try to catch up with your questions tonight. Yes, so we just hope this is a summer sweet experience. Life might not be a bowl of cherries, but uh, a handful helps. And so who can't stop thinking about guava because we've been being we need the names and uh, you know, just a little summertime fun. So there's about a dozen of us here in the Google offices. And um, I think there's about the same amount of you out there uh, streaming with us. So we've done pretty much our greetings and introductions. We then we're going to give time for No Violet to give us some discussion. And if she'd like to read a little bit of the book, too, that's fine. Um, we'll have a reader's response, the facilitated Q&A, and then we'll have closing remarks. So before we get started with No Violet, we're going to take a few minutes. She wrote a book, but this is Opportunity Network, so I'm taking the opportunity to have everyone, um, even if you're on the Hangout, um, do a little exercise with us. Take a piece of paper, and we're going to write something called, uh, we're going to use a technique called the 55 word story. Has anybody ever done any work with 55 word stories? So 55 word stories are just three stories that have 55 words, and they're, they don't take long to write. And I'm going to ask you to write about something really familiar. So does everybody have a piece of paper? Story, so the story is supposed to have 55 words. The topic for tonight is you have the opportunity to tell the story of your first name. How did you come to be the first name that we, we call you by? How did you become Michelle or Megan or Catherine or Gail or Janae or Violet or Chemi? So what you can do is, you can just start writing the story. 
have yes, I have a few prompts that you can think. I have a few prompts you can think about when you're writing, um, and I'm going to give you five minutes to kind of ponder all this. You can think about I'm named after. A lot of times people are named after a parent, a grandparent. What did your parents tell you about your name? What do your siblings say about your name? You can also think about every time my name comes up, people think. Every time my name's mentioned, people think, people, what do people tell you about your name? And think of some words that come to mind, or phrases that come to mind when you when you think of your name. What's your name associated with? Just tell the story of your name. How do you know? It could be something simple or complicated. Um, this exercise also, um, so it's one of brevity is a kind of reflective practice, and it connects you to your own personal narrative. I also find in most settings, when we share a little bit, um, you close, you'll hear some things about diversity and um, community and family. Those kinds of things. Two minutes. How's it coming? Anybody stuck?
Okay. So since we're going to finish up. Does anyone want to read? You can read also. You can go and hang out on air. You can, if somebody has a story, just post it up here. Um, does anyone want to share their story? You get one or two. Uh -huh. Say your name. Ashley, Ashley. Do you want to come up here? Come up here. Sure. And who else is going to share besides Ashley? <laughs> My name originated from a small girl's dream, pondering her future, where she will grow and one day have a daughter named Ashley. Let the name be simple and common to show how she may blend in with her world. Her name was in out in mere spirit. Let her name break the chain of Barbara's, which many generations carried on before. Although simple and common, my name shall be as it should always truly be me. Wow. Um, 78. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect you to put out one more. Come on. Uh -huh. Viola often mispronounced as Viola, like the actress was my grandmother's middle name. I'm supposed to be a musical person because of it, but oftentimes I find myself listening to the performing. I sometimes tell people that I was named after the heroine Viola in Twelfth Night because my middle name is Sebastian, pronounced like the crab, but not spelled like it. I wasn't named after anyone in Twelfth Night, it was just like a coincidence. <laughs> Does anyone else want to share? Uh -huh. <laughs> Next one. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, my name is Janae. Reverberating from the vocal cords of an R&B sensation is me. Janae, Janae, Janae. Every time someone hears my name, they hearted it, and suddenly I'm Janae. Is it a French name? No, I think it's Hebrew. Always a shock when it glides off the tongue of my friends' mouths. I wonder who they're calling. Some French girl? Uh, 56? Yeah. yeah. There you go. So thanks to Ashley and Violet and Janae for sharing your 55 stories. And you can see it's a phenomenal exercise, and it's an opportunity to have a conversation just around. So next time you're, you don't think you have uh, anything to talk about, there's a lot to this We Need New Names. There's, there's a lot. And the title also reminds me of a poem that Pro um, Priest wrote which is entitled, We Speak Your Name, which is often done um, in ceremonies and on occasions as a way of honoring the elders or the past. Um, so we'll let, um, without further ado, I do want to take the opportunity to introduce um, the and then we'll let her get right to it. Um, so Novaya Bulawayo was born and raised in Zimbabwe. She now lives in the U.S. She's won the 2011 King Prize for African Writing. And her work has been published in numerous anthologies, the Boston Review, Kalamu, and Newsweek. She's earned an MFA at Cornell University and was recognized with the Truman Capote Fellowship. She is now a Wallace Stagner Fellow at Stanford University. And we're pleased to have her live from Kalamazoo, Michigan, with her sister Jody. Welcome, Don Violet. How are Thank you? you? I am doing great. So I hope you could hear our 
uh, introductory exercise and get a little bit of feel for what we were doing. I, I didn't hear you, but sorry. Yeah. No, so I don't know if you heard our exercise, but we will, we're really excited to be with you this evening. Oh yes, I, I enjoyed the exercise. I think it's I'm hearing it also. Is that normal? Yeah, just give us a second. Here, we'll stop the echo right now. It should be okay. better. Okay, great. I think that works. Right? Okay. Um so I'm just gonna go ahead. My name as you know is No Violet Wulawayo. And can you hear me okay? All right. Um and I guess as a follow-up to your name exercise, your wonderful name exercise, my own name is a celebration of my mother. Um, her name was Violet, and she died when I was a baby. And growing up, she wasn't really spoken about, and you know, I hardly heard any stories about her, really. So I, I kind of grew up with this sense of... Uh, with this sense of loss and sense of wanting to know that part of of myself, and so when I dis when I decided I was grown enough to do what I wanted to do, I decided to adopt her name as a way of honoring her memory, and the N O part in my language in English, of course, it says no, and people are always like, what does the no mean? No violent. But the NO part in my language means with, so it translates to with violet. And for me, um, you know, I felt like it gave me some sort of uh, personal peace and personal closure. And Wulawayo is the name of my people, that's my hometown. Um, and as someone who spent more than a decade in the US before I was even able to go back home, I really felt homesick, uh, homesick and nostalgic, and using that name kind of helped me, you know, keep in touch with my homeland, like forge, forge a connection when it was not possible to be there um, physically. I find it interesting that in order to write We Need New Names, I had to kind of revision my identity and self you know, sort of come up, give myself basically a new name, one that I felt strongly about, one that was deeply personal to me, the one that said something about what I wanted to, what I, you know, how I wanted to be, to be seen, a name that had to carry me in the world. I don't think my father is excited about it, frankly. Um, you know, I come from a culture, it's a very strong patriarchal culture where your father's name is a name that you carry until you get married. And, you know, if I were home right now, they'd call me by my father's last name. Even, you know, women, his female children would be called, you know, you get an MA first and then your last name. But, you know, I, I feel like it, it has to mean something to me. And the name I was given at birth was, uh, was actually my grandmother's name. So I can see why. He may not be impressed with me giving myself a new name, but the reality I, is, is that I wanted something that spoke to me, which is, after all, my, my experience and um, my life. I was born in Zimbabwe, obviously, um, at the end of British colonial rule. I am the uh, only one of my mother's children who was born in a free country. And my generation is known as the born free generation a term that was given to kids who were born after April 1980, which was when Zimbabwe got its uh, independence from, from Britain. So this political event kind of meant many things to, to our life, um, to our childhoods. But what is important for me is that it meant uh, we lived very, very normal lives. In other words, the kids who were born before 1980 were born, were not born in a free country. So, you know, the, the quality of their lives, the things that they went through um, were different. I mean, when we got independence, Zimbabwe had been in a two-decade war with Britain, for instance. 
So I, I grew up, you know, with relative normalcy. Life was uh, pretty decent, and the game, the games and fun that uh, that you guys hopefully read in the novel were inspired by my own childhood, a time that I will always uh, remember with fondness. So there's that difference between my childhood and the you know, and the childhoods of Darling and Bastard and Chimpo and God knows and Stina and Spo, in the sense that when they grow up, when I grow up, um, the whereas when they grow up, the country is falling apart. So I feel like we occupy two different, uh, two different spaces in, in Zimbabwean history. And um, one thing I'll mention about my childhood, I think that may illuminate how you perceive names, uh, or maybe myself, is that I was raised on uh, on stories. I come from a culture of orator, told stories. We did not have a, a TV growing up. Um, so aside from play, stories were like the, a very big part of our entertainment. I remember in the villages, you know, when schools were off session, we were put in a bus and shipped to the village where my grandmother told us stories every night. So that was our that was our entertainment. And uh, my father was also a very very big storyteller. You know, um, again stories stories every day. And beyond that, we were. We were just surrounded by, by by stories, either on the playground or the women who raised us. I mean, we were growing up at a time when most women were really housewives. There were a few who worked, but the majority really stayed at home with the kids. So we were always surrounded by women who were talking, you know, telling stories, whether they were things that they were going through. So I think what happened is that I developed an appreciation of, of story from a very, very early age. And I just enjoyed telling stories. I remember getting in trouble in class because I was always talking, you know, I was always telling stories. Um, so when, when I'm tracing my development, I mean, sometimes people just assume that writers come from reading books, you know. But the thing is, nobody was reading me books as a kid, but people were telling, telling stories. Um, and that's a, that's always something that I would I, I would I would point to when I'm looking at my at my origins at where I come from as an artist. Now I did go to school, obviously um, high school, advanced high school before coming here, and there I also encountered I guess the other side of storytelling. That is the formal, the told storytelling. I encountered uh, books. We didn't have that many many books, especially during my younger years. But um, there were some books I, I I think I enjoyed. I don't know if you guys uh, have heard of the Hardy Boys. Maybe that's too old school for you. Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew, and I also read a lot of British books. It makes sense because we used to, you know, we used to be. A, a British colony, so we use. I, I grew up on a stable diet of uh, British writers, and when I was doing my early writing, I thought that was what books were supposed to sound like. Not to say I don't like British writing, but I I, I think it's very very flat, very kind of boring. Um, and it was only when I moved to the U.S. for college and I uh, encountered writers like uh, Juno Diaz and Sandra Cisneros who wrote in, a, in this English that kind of captured their unique Latino experience, you know, with, uh, with these very interesting rhythms, you know, kind of captured the way they spoke in real life. That I realized that, you know, I do not have to sound like the English writers that I grew up reading. I can sound like myself. I can sound like a regular storyteller in my grandmother's kitchen. And I, 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 I guess that gave me the freedom to, to embrace that part of my, my upbringing and the, the permission to actually create using that, uh, 
using that voice. I, uh, I left Zim at the age of 18, right, right after high school, um, to study law in the US. And I know you guys are, are still in high school. You haven't started college. But I think at some point soon, you will identify with my, um, with my story of living in the sense that you all have to be shipped off somewhere to college in another state, maybe. Um, I don't know if that would be good or bad. <laughs> but in my case, it, it wasn't just being shipped off to college. It was me leaving my country altogether. And it would be like 13 solid years before I was able to return. Moving from Zimbabwe to the US kind of meant a lot of things, but um, for the purposes of our discussion, it also meant I was going to experience life as an immigrant. It meant living in a country that I would never call my country because I was from somewhere else. Of course, it's not special. I'm sure you guys know that the U.S. is a nation of, of immigrants, right? That people came and continue to come from all over the world um, in search of greener pastures. I think some of you guys may even have immigrant roots yourself. Yourself. So that's. Uh, I think that also that that is something that binds lots of uh, lots of people here. But I, I I thought it was kind of important for me to talk about my experience because it really was not really an easy um, experience. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't easy. And to that end, part of the book that's set in the US kind of deals with that. It's not autobiographical. It's not a straight up uh, telling of my story. But of course, it's inspired by my personal story and the stories of other people that I have had along the way. And that is because I'm interested in, 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 in literature that sort of mirrors us, that gives us something to look at and see ourselves, and then hopefully ask the question, who are we, where are we going, and what will we become when I get there? I'm interested in stories that open, open up dialogue, uh, open up engaged ways of looking at other people assuming maybe you're not an immigrant yourself, but it should tell you something about other people. Um, I don't think I, I would have written We Need New Names without being a reader of other books, um, a reader of other people, a lover of other writers. So to that end, there are, you know, there are many writers who speak to me, and some of my favorite include Writers like uh, Toni Morrison, Edward P. Jones, Hume Balahiri, um, William Faulkner, Edwish Dantica, um, and most of these are writers that I encountered in my classes. I was an English major um, for a while, and I, I, I think that's that also kind of fed my, you know, fed my ambition. While you know, while we're here talking about books, um, I think it's useful to, you know, I, I don't know what people's interests are, but if you are interested in storytelling, I think this is the age, and I wish somebody told me this when I was in high school, I think this is the age to start figuring yourself out in terms of the kinds of writers who speak to you, who mean something to you. And sort of giving yourself those informal mentors and role models, those standards that you want to aspire to in your own, uh, you know, in your own writing. You are not always going to be given book titles to read in class, you know. And I'm always challenging young people to to look beyond the classroom because there's a whole world of books out there that are not on your syllabus that your teacher is not always uh, going to give to you. So if you read a book that you like, go to Amazon, plug it in, type in the title, and it's going to give you another similar book or something. 
So just, just keep reading, and if you happen to be interested in writing, just identify the kind of writers that you like, read all their books. Um, at this age, it's normal to start writing by imitation. You know, you read a story that you like, say, hey, I'm just going to try and write something like that. Um, besides books, I think I'll also mention that we are always surrounded by stories. Part of We Need New Names came from what was happening around me. Um, I started the book in 2008, and that was a difficult time for for Zimbabwe because, you know, basically this last decade, it was a time when the country was falling apart due to failure of leadership. That led to things like the highest inflation in the world. You would call home and people would tell you that they are hungry because there's no food in the stores. Um, there was violence because the government was trying to, you know, was trying to, to repress people, was trying to die through opposition. So it, it just, people were just being beaten up for, for speaking out against the government. And all the bad things that you, you may have read in the first chapter. So those were things that were going on. And um, I was accessing this through phone calls home, through emails, through Skyping with people and through through social social media. And I'm always, I mean, beyond that, I'm always interested in what's going on around me. Um, I do a bit of traveling. And I think I was in Cape Town, South Africa, when I was editing We Need New Names. And what I found interesting was how being in Cape Town actually enhance the book, you know, it, 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 every specific um, space has its own powers, you know, that kind of affects the, the way you process things. So Cape Town for me, I think at the time I was tying up We Need New Names was a blessing, so much so that I ended up um, adding almost a chapter or so, something that would not have happened if I stayed in New York, which was where I was uh, where I did my, my MFA. So traveling, and I know you guys travel a lot, um, be open to embracing each, you know, each place and whatever story it has to, to offer. This is summertime. I know you guys are doing interesting things out there. And um, I, I think that's about it. I would rather hear your voices. So I, I think we'll open up to your, to your brilliant questions and take it from there. So Janae yeah. is going to give uh, readers response. We just wanted to have you to have some feedback about the book. Okay. So, oh. Yeah. So this is on the spot, but I really enjoyed reading your book, so I can definitely do this on the spot. Um, okay. So I thought your book was absolutely poetic. I loved the way it flowed. It didn't read like something I was supposed to read in school, which was lovely to me. And I think. When you write poetry in the way that you wrote your book, it wasn't meant to be poetry, but it was reading in that way. When you write it like that, you kind of the time seems to kind of balloon, and then sometimes it shrinks, and sometimes it goes in different places. And what was really interesting was that at certain points in your book, uh, specifically at the end, uh, Darling kind of imagines her generation coming and immigrating from Zimbabwe mm -hmm. and integrating in America, and then having kids that don't understand that story and that struggle. And just, I think it was like five pages, but it went through generations of um, strife of um, acclimating to America, acclimating to immigration, acclimating to not fitting in, acclimating to not having the culture and tradition of the place that you came from, and seeing your kids take on America completely and not have any background. So I thought the poetry of your book and the poetry of specifically that scene kind of um, it was helpful for me to see um, what you thought the future was going to look like for immigrants coming out of Zimbabwe, different parts of Africa, or other um, places where culture is a big part, and America seems to dilute that by being just so great and big, consumerist, and we like to consume cultures, but we don't like to add to them. So it was, it was really great for me to read um, your book, because I always say that I'm an indigenous um, African-American, so um, I don't, I can't go back and have the same um, tradition and culture. 
that um, you would have with this book. But it was great to see what that would look like. And um, I really enjoyed reading it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, we're taking questions here in the room among ourselves. And um, I'm going to open up the conversation. I'm going to leave it to Megan and Michelle to kind of field questions. But if you have questions and you want to hang out on the air, please um, let me know. Uh, let us know, and we will ask no while it's uh, for you. Or, um, yeah, just go ahead and type your question. Go ahead. Is there a place in Baba in America in the place? Could you hear that, no Violet? So the question was, is there a Zimbabwe in America meeting place? Is there a Zimbabwe in America? I didn't hear the last one. Is there a place in America where um, Zimbabweans uh, meet, come together? On Facebook. <laughs> no, I'm just uh, I'm just kidding. I, I think every state has its own um, its own thing. I think people do like uh, what do you call socials where they play soccer and barbecue and uh, stuff like that. And I think once a year, all Zimbabweans gather in one um, in one state and just just hang out and, and, and connect. I think this year it was in somewhere in Dallas, Texas. So you're going to have to speak up. Come, come over here by the mic. Your and say, be sure to say your name. And, uh, Hi, uh, my name is Caroline. And, uh, I have a question about political structure in Zimbabwe. Um, what? Sorry? The political structure in Zimbabwe, like, has anything changed um, politically or socially? Are people's attitudes about the government still the same? Or is it, like, what has changed in Zimbabwe? Um, well, what has changed from the time I was writing? I'm hearing the again. Sorry. Okay. So what, what has changed now is that uh, after the, the, the failed 2008 election, there was a coalition government between our president, who has been in power just before I was born, and the prime minister, who, who is believed to have won the election, but then the current government rigged it. So there was that, um, that marriage for, for convenience. And what that did is it sort of stopped the violence, um, which was one of the most trouble, troubling things because it wasn't fair. I mean, women were being raped, um, people were being beaten up, a few activists disappeared and showed up dead. So all that stopped, and then the economy kind of stabilized a little bit. Right now we're using the US dollar, um, and you can go to a shop and be able to buy food. But of course, the, the downside is that not everybody is able to, you know, to, to work. And not everybody is the US dollar. Tomorrow, we are having an election again. So the two parties are again headed for the ballot. And there are already fears of, of um, you know, rigging by the government again, for example, there are thousands of people who are dead or out of the country who are appearing on the voter on the voter ballot. So that's uh, on the voter registration roll, and that's again that's that's not a good sign. Um, but that said, there's not been political violence yet, even though there are reports incidents here and there of um, people being abused, I guess, being intimidated. So we're all crossing our fingers for, for tomorrow. You know, we all want a, a better country, a better future. So we don't know what's going to happen, but we're hoping for the best. Thank you for your, for your question. <laughs> I 
Hi, I'm Chenny, and my question is, um, what obstacles have you faced throughout um, your writing in the book, when you, when you wrote the book? And how what did you obstacles? <laughs> Um, I wrote in book. I wrote this book when I was in school, when I was studying for my uh, MFA at Cornell. It's a it's a graduate degree. Um, that's what I decided to do instead of going to law school. Again, my 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 dad may not may not be happy about that, but it's what happened. So the fact that I was going to school, it's four year program. The fact that I was going to school and studying and working hard. Um, you know, made me feel like I didn't really have that many obstacles because I was constantly working. I mean, I understood that I had to always be working. So, and I understood that I had to produce something, um, something solid at the end of my uh, my four years. And at that point, I really didn't. I tried not to, to think in terms of writing a book. I was just working, you know, as just a student working on my trap um, on my craft. And so by the end of, of, of four years I had a I had a draft that was ready to be to be sent out. Um it, it does I mean being published doesn't always come come easy, you know. Um, it's a matter of connecting with, with the right people who see your book the same way who who are enthusiastic about your book. But I, I think I was one of those lucky people in the sense that in as much as the first few people that I kind of approached weren't interested, I was quickly able to find some somebody who who could appreciate what I was trying to do. And um, we just made a good team. And from there on, we found a publisher who was also equally enthusiastic. And now you are reading the book. So for me, it wasn't. It wasn't a major obstacle course, but I, I feel like even if it had been, you know, you, you write out of passion, you write because you have a story to tell and believe it, I would just, I just would have kept trying until it got into the right hands. Thank you. So, um, why, did, why was there no quotation marks throughout the book? So, Viola's question was, um, why did you choose to write the dialogue without quotation marks, without the punctuation?
because of her. Yeah. Sorry about that, Viola. Yeah. Yeah. But the last name is Brown. Is yes. that right? Okay, I'm sorry. I apologize. See? Um, I was just going to ask, um, it was great that you shared your 55 word stories with us. So if you want to just let me take a picture of your work. Okay, thank you. Uh, be able to share it. Nobody was back with us. So let's see if we can get the last question answered. We're just at the end of the hour, so we're happy you came back. Um, I had a little special treat for you, too. So, um, so they were asking about the dialogue, uh, why there were no quotes in the book. Was that intentional or? Uh... Um, it was, you know, I, I wanted to sort of break with what is, what is normal, what people regularly do. And I feel like as long as you can set it up, as long as it's clear who's talking, you really, you really don't need the quotes. So that's one of those style things that, uh, that, that I do. So uh, I just want to really thank you, No Violet, for joining us. Um, and I want to thank those of you on Hangout on Air who came for our book discussion and those who are here in the room. And just as a way of sharing just a little bit, I can't believe how much opened up for me personally just in this book selection and this experience. I'd like to share with you a poem by Don Matera. He's a South African poet. Um, and he wrote this Zimbabwe love song. And so that's how I'm going to close this out. It's just with a poem. It says, sing and dance, sons, daughters of Zimbabwe. It is a call of a timeless glory and the beat of the native song that beckon you to struggle on. Nana Zimbabwe, it is your dance of daring feet which set the bush ablaze made the dying sweet. Sing and dance, daughters and sons of Zimbabwe. It is the rooster that sings of children marching against the wind. The white night is dead, freedom walks in the sunrise and in the glow of an eternal love song. So thank you for joining us and let the conversations continue I think we all know that the world has become a new place with social media where we can engage and continue to talk. So we can continue to make comments on Facebook. Um, feel free to email, email me and uh, you know we'll try to get your questions answered. But this was truly a special opportunity for all of us. We're in New York. You're in Michigan. Uh, I think some folks are out there from around the world, so it's just great that we could have this time together. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I enjoyed the discussion, and good luck with your, with your studies, everybody. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you.